in Barcelona that are offering a uh, masters uh, which have a connection with uh, the Mediterranean. This is the case also of eBay, the institution I am representing uh, right now. Uh, in fact, uh, some of we have some of our students here who are taking courses on uh, the Middle East and, and the Mediterranean, but I see also lots of uh, new uh, faces, which is uh, great news, I would say, in the sense that perhaps because now we are witnessing a new wave of interest uh, for what happens uh, in our immediate neighborhood uh, in the Maghreb. It has been thanks also, I would say thanks, to this uh, month of protests and unrest in Algeria that I think many people have understood that uh, it's not an option to turn our backs and think that, uh, that these are societies that don't move, that the political situation is always stagnant, that things cannot change. Uh, in a way, probably because of all the frustrations after 2011 that became again the dominant paradigm. But I say that events show us that uh, this is both wrong and it's not a luxury that we can afford. So today we're gonna focus on uh, uh, Morocco, uh, a country also which has a long history also of social movements, of uh, protests, and also a long history of the ability and the different strategies of the political system to either absorb, co-opt, or counter. Uh, those uh, popular mobilizations. To do that, we have uh, an excellent speaker with us today. I'm so glad that, that you managed to come, Salwa. Salwa Sarhuni. she is a professor at Mohammed V uh, University in Rabat and the president of the Rabat Social Studies Institute. She's uh, one of the best uh, Moroccan political scientists and also brilliant speaker. We've known each other for quite a while now. And uh, as I said, welcome to Barcelona, welcome to Yemet, Bay, uh, to this uh, city and to this crowd. And we are all looking forward for you to enlighten us to better understand the dynamics in the streets and in the palaces oh. in Morocco. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Edward. Uh, thanks for the invitation. I'm uh, very pleased to be here. Uh, with you in IEMED and also in Barcelona. You're lucky to live in such a beautiful city. <laughs> um, I will be speaking today about uh, popular mobilization in Morocco and the politics of change. Uh, how does it work? Mm -hmm. And uh, to develop my ideas, I will first introduce the context and the recent dynamic of uh, mobilization and protests in Morocco. And I will focus mainly on the past decade, the past 10 years. Then I will um, put it in context because if we wanna understand what's going on in Morocco, I think one of the main questions to be raised is why do Moroccans have recourse more often to protest and popular mobilization in Morocco and not to other means in order to express themselves and to influence policies in the country. Third, I will speak uh, about uh, the drivers of protest. Uh, and finally, I will end my presentation uh, by speaking about the strategies that have been used by the regime in order to deal with the dynamic of protest. So uh, when we look at uh, Morocco and the politics in the streets during the past 10 years, we can say that there is sustained actions of protests. And they have been expressed mainly through peaceful means. And from different parts in Morocco, from different regions, online and offline, uh, as uh, all of you know, especially the youth, they use more the cyberspace to become active and to voice their demands. We also have Moroccans who mobilize as collectives in different kinds as social movements, as informal groups, or 
just as ordinary citizens, just as a people. Claims are often made to the government in response to governmental action or inaction. So sometimes it's the government which takes some policies and the people are not satisfied or do not agree with the government policies and sometimes the government doesn't take action and the people will go to the streets in order to ask for action, for reforms, for policies to deal with a specific issue. Um, also, I looked at what have triggered popular mobilization in Morocco and uh, I can say that mainly we have social and economic rights, we have demands for democracy, uh, for more democracy, and we have also demands for more respects for human rights and public liberties. Very often when in a country or in a state there is frequent, frequent mobilization, that means that the power of existing structures and agencies is questioned. And it means also that there is a risk of instability. In Morocco, despite the fact that there is continuous protest actions, the regime has been able to maintain its power and stabilize its rule. So I have three questions. First, why, do, why is protest becoming a frequent mode of popular expression in Morocco? Why do people mobilize and how, the regime, and, and how has the regime been able to maintain its rule and stability in the face of popular protest? And to answer the first question, I have to mention the process of political liberalization, which has started in Morocco under the late King Hassan II, and which has continued or has been reinforced under the rule of King Mohammed VI. People feel that there is more freedom to express themselves. People fear, especially the young people who have been socialized in the 90s, that there is less fear of authority. It's not like my, gen not my mm. generation, I'm the still fathers. young, <laughs> like the previous generation who were socialized under King Hassan II rule and during the 60s and the 70s, which were known by violent repression of political expression. So, and the process started under King Hassan II in the 90s through two constitutional revisions, then he called upon the socialists and their leader, Abdurrahman al-Yusufi, to form the government of alternance. With the ascension to power of King Mohammed VI in 1999, he reinforced the process of liberalization, political liberalization. So he uh, confirmed his attachment to a constitutional monarchy. He declared or he uh, developed a new concept of authority based on accountability. That was the first thing that Mohammed VI uh, um, uh, put forward in the first speeches he gave to the nation after his ascension to power. Also fighting poverty, uh, uh, fighting for women's rights were some of his top priorities. So we had this new context in which two kings, there is a transition, and there is some kind of opening, which uh, made the people more aware or made them conscious that they can, they have some freedom of expression. For me, the second, uh, uh, the second factor which played a role uh, in the fact that people are going more and more to the streets is mistrust in political institutions mainly political parties, unions, and the parliament. These institutions normally play the intermediary, intermediary role between the people and the government. But these institutions have been discredited from one election to the other. When we look at the turnout of electoral participation in Morocco, it has been decreasing 
and it reached its highest level during the 2007 legislative elections, during which only 37% of Moroccan registered voters went into the polls in order to vote. That means that people do not trust necessarily the elections, political parties, and the established institutions in Morocco. And usually, and in principle, people, if they have demands, they have to, if I am a university professor and I have specific demands vis-a-vis -vis the state, I can use the union, the union of professors to voice my demands and to influence policies. But all these institutions have not been playing their role and have been discredited mainly because of the centrality of the monarchical institution in Morocco. Mm -hmm. The third uh, factor which I think is also important is discontent and disenchantment with state policies in different fields especially the major fields such as education, employment, health, justice. In Morocco, we have been speaking about the reform of, education, of the educational system since the 90s. And recently, like uh, 10 years ago, again, we are speaking about reforming the reform of the educational system. So there is some kind of frustration among the people in general, and this frustration combined with a context which favored some freedom of expression, pushed them to have recourse more to uh, mo uh, protest action than to channel their demands through formal institutions and uh, mechanisms. And here I would like to uh, speak about um, the drivers and what's happening, what has been happening in terms of protest actions in Morocco. I've been doing research and it's just too many actions. <laughs> like in 2012, according to a sociologist, Abdurrahman Rashid, who wrote a book on social movements in Morocco, in 2012, 57 protest action are taking place per day in Morocco. And it's a variety of modes of actions. It could be a sit-in, it could be a march, it could be signing a petition, it could be uh, 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 all, the, all the different forms of protest actions that we know of uh, have been taking place per day. So it's a bit difficult really uh, to give statistics about all the protest actions that are taking place. But what we can say that uh, protest has, been, uh, has become frequent in Morocco. And I will focus in my presentation on the main movements and protest actions that took place during the past decade. And here I will start with as you can see in the picture on the, on the right, on your left, which means my right is your left, you can see a picture of the Gdim Ezi camp. And uh, you can see tents there. And it's thousands of Sahrawi uh, who pitch tents and stay for weeks in a desert area nearby the city of Layoun. And that was uh, uh, done in order mainly to denounce social and economic conditions. I took also as an example the February 20th movement, which is uh, uh, the movement uh, which uh, uh, was led by a group of uh, online activists in Morocco in the context of the so-called Arab Spring. Uh, and I'm sure uh, you're familiar with the Arab Spring and the wave of protest that took place in the region, which started in Tunisia and then uh, spread throughout the region uh, in different countries. The main demands of the movement, and I will uh, go uh, later, I will go back uh, to the demands of the protesters later in my presentation, were mainly about dignity, social justice, and, uh, and freedom. 
In 2013, of course, there were reforms uh, initiated by the monarchy and uh, uh, the social unrest was absorbed. However, in 2013, we had again some kind of protest. And this time, for the uh, first time in the history of Morocco, Moroccans contested a decision taken by the king. In 2013, the king amnesty gave amnesty to a Spanish pedophile who was convicted of raping 11 Moroccan children ranged in age from 4 to 14. So this decision created anger among the people in Morocco and some 80,000 Moroccans mobilized in the city of Rabat, only in Rabat, I'm sp not speaking about other cities, against the king's decision. In 2016, 2017, we had, uh, again, another wave of protest, which is known as Hirak of the Reef, or the popular um, uh, the uh, Hirak Shaabi, or popular, uh, not uprising, the Mouvement Populaire, popular movement of the reef. And you can see in the middle of the picture, it's the leader, one of the leaders of the movement, Zef Zafi. I took on purpose the picture, so uh, when I will speak later on about how the state <laughs> managed his case, uh, we have the picture. And, um, Nearby, uh, well, I will speak a bit about the reef region and Al Husima. Al Husima in Morocco, we have different regions, but uh, uh, we have um, lots of disparities in terms of social and economic disparities between the different regions. And the north and the region of uh, Husima, Tanger, Tetouan. Um, uh, Part of it, not all of it, part of it has been neglected by the state, first under the rule of King Hassan II, and there was a history of confrontation between the people in the region and the monarchy, but with the arrival to power of King Mohammed VI, there was some kind of reconciliation with the region. And the, the monarch developed some programs to further develop the region economically and socially. And in 2015, there was this big developmental project called Manarat Al Mutawasit, which had different, uh, which contained different reforms in terms of. Uh, building universities, hospitals, the infrastructure, creating jobs in the region for the people in the region. So the people there, 2015, after this big project and ceremonials with the king and different ministers, 2016, 2017, nothing was established yet. But there was a, a, an, an incident which triggered, <coughs> triggered the protest. That is um, uh, the, the affair of uh, Mohsin Fikri. This is a fishmonger. Do we call fishmonger or fishmonger? Uh, fishmonger. fishmonger. Well, uh, a guy who, uh, who was yeah. fishmonger uh, yeah. because uh, it was not uh, a legal, uh, not legal fisherman. Exactly. Let me. And it was Les Pado. No? It was Les Pado. <laughs> and uh, he was fishing swordfish. Exactly. So uh, he was killed uh, trying to retrieve confiscated fish. In response to that, uh, in fact, he was crushed inside. The, this uh, fishermonger, he was uh, crushed inside a rubbish truck trying to recover the confiscated fish by the police. And there, were, there was videos everywhere of this throughout Morocco. And again, Moroccans, they went into the streets 
first in the region of the north mainly, but afterwards throughout Morocco to denounce this kind of uh, humiliation and this kind of violence towards the fishermonger. So that was really the incident which mobilized the Moroccans into the streets. Uh, in the region, and the Hirak of the Reef, and also outside of the region. Nearby Al uh, Husima and, uh, 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 and uh, the region, there is another city uh, called Gerada. So here I'm speaking about the protest in Gerada. And uh, uh, this city was dependent for years on, on mine, but the government closed, clo closed 20 years ago um, uh, uh, the mine and left the people without any access, without access to one of the main resources which was uh, used by the people in order to uh, survive. So, uh, and again, there was an incident which triggered really a protest in the city. Besides the fact that people were encouraged by the wave of protest in Hosima in the north region, there were two brothers, miners. They went into the mine and they were killed while trying to, uh, um, uh, while trying to um, extract. extract really, uh, uh, I have the words in French, not in English, <laughs> while trying to extract some pits from, from the mine of uh, Gerada. Third, I'm sharing here another a picture from another uh, protest action which uh, took place in Zagura. It's a city in the valley of Darha in the southeast of Morocco. So I was speaking about the north, but the picture here you're seeing many women uh, and they have in their hands uh, big bottles, but empty. Uh, bottles that they use for to um, fill in with uh, uh, drinking water. So uh, in Zagura, we call it la marche de la soif, the march of uh, thirst. And uh, all of these actions took place in 2017. And again, some uh, thousand uh, inhabitants of the city, they organized a march different marches, peaceful marches, and sittings in the city in order to ask the state for drinking and clean water. In the city of Zagura, uh, they don't have access many hours per day to water. And the people there were really upset about the situation. So in a spontaneous way, they went into the streets in order to ask for their rights. I gave different examples from different cities and regions in Morocco, and I showed how there is some kind of mobiliza mobilization about different issues. And I didn't mention the boycott, mm -hmm. the campaign, uh, the boycott uh, campaign, uh, which took place uh, last year in Morocco, and it was nationwide and it targeted some big companies in Morocco which monopolize uh, some products such as water, Danone, and other products. So uh, uh, people in Morocco go use more and more, uh, uh, mobilize more and more online and offline for different issues. So what can we learn from popular mobilization in Morocco? I think at least we can learn the following. Um, we have grievances and demands uh, that are expressed both from the margins and the center. And when I speak here about the margins and the center, it's in terms of space and not in terms of power. Because when it comes to power, what is happening in Morocco, the margins or the margin is imposing its issues on the center. What happened with the Herat of the Reef, it's really imposing on the state, the central state in Rabat, to think about the issues happening in the margins. But I'm, thinking, I'm speaking here about space. 
while the M20 had a national dimension because it was a call for more democracy, more freedom, uh, uh, for some groups a parliamentary monarchy, most of the protest actions that took place during the past decade had to do with localistic and sectorial demands. I also didn't mention in uh, uh, my presentation protests organized by the teachers in Morocco. Like uh, uh, last weekend, uh, there was uh, uh, some 40,000 uh, teachers uh, who came from different cities in Morocco in order uh, to protest, to ask uh, for uh, uh, a contract with social benefits because they have, they have been recruited according to a specific contract which does not really respect or give them the rights and uh, uh, some social benefits and retirement. There, were, there was also protest by the students of the School of Medicine. So we have really different <laughs> groups, students, teachers, professional groups organizing protests, but I didn't mention all of them. So, but one characteristic is that it's either sectorial, which means it's uh, about a specific professional issue, or localistic, it's about a local issue. Apart from the February 20th movement and the boycott, the campaign of a boycott. Also, um, Moroccans mobilize in a spontaneous way, which means they, they are not uh, necessarily, it's not about political parties uh, uh, mobilizing them. It's really, they will go into the streets in a very spontaneous way, but when I say that, uh, I have to say that there is a growing capacity to coordinate peaceful and lasting protest actions in Morocco. Uh, we can see that in the February 20th movement and also with the Hirak of the Rif, how people were able, uh, despite uh, repression from the state, control from the state, to coordinate uh, their actions in a peaceful way. Another thing, there is less fear of authority and an emerging active citizenship among different people, the youth and uh, not necessarily only the younger generation. But regardless of the diversity of issues, what unites the different protesters is a common aspiration for social inclusion. So, uh, uh, of course, uh, the triggers were different, but all of them uh, have to do with social inclusion. So uh, here, uh, how does the regime or how has the regime been able to, uh, uh, to maintain its power and rule? And this is what I say, uh, the strategy of change within continuity. So uh, for me, monarchical resilience in Morocco is very much related to the capacity of the regime to adapt to new situations and challenges. Historically speaking, the reaction of the regime to potential challengers very often vacillated between the adoption of reforms, cooptation, intimidation, and repression. Now, the dosage and timing of each tactic matter and influences the outcome. Uh, all of these strategies combined at once, but they use how much repression, how much reform, how much concessions, what is the, what are the, what is the nature of political concessions. It varies from one moment, political moment, to the other. For me, it's like the Moroccan tagine. I don't know if you know the Moroccan tagine. I saw a, l a young lady smiling. So, but whenever I speak about this dosage of tactics, I think of the Moroccan tagine and the spices and how much spices we put. Then the outcome is different. It's the same spices. It's a tagine, but the taste is different and the name is different of the tagine. <laughs> it varies. Um, so 
So uh, really to understand what's happening today, we have to look back at what happened uh, during the rule of King Hassan II. So when uh, Edward <laughs> spoke about Morocco, uh, how the palace, the politics of the palace, it's really uh, business as usual. It's something like the know-how skills of the regime and how the regime dealt with challengers and then this is what they use, whatever the issue, whatever the challenger is, they will try to use the same tactics. So under the late king, Morocco was ruled by King Hassan II between 1961 and 1999. So, and here I'm speaking about only three main tactics, repression, cooptation, and limited reforms. Well, when I speak about repression, if we look at the first three decades of Hassan II's rule, this rule was punctuated by a dozen of mass political trials and violent and violence, suppression of major urban insurrection. We had two attempted coup in the 70s, late in the um, early uh, 70s. And uh, uh, 84, we had uh, uh, major uh, uh, in, in insurrections in Morocco, but the king was able uh, to manage, mainly, mainly during this period through the use of violence. There was some kind of cooptation and we had an institutional life, we had elections, we had a parliament, we had political parties, and there was all the time negotiations between the palace and political parties. But the dosage of violence and repression was the highest during this period. We had cooptation and limited reforms, but more violence. Cooptation, uh, ju just to explain, it's a tactic used by the king to buy out influential, non-violent adversaries and to reward supporters within the political elite. So uh, uh, challengers could be within the left, leftist political parties, the communist party or the religious establishment. So whenever we have those adversaries, or we have those allies, we will reward them through cooptation by giving them positions in the government, in parliament, or sending them as ambassador somewhere to mm -hmm. a nice place. Limited reforms. Well, he introduced the king, late king, Hassan II, introduced liberal reforms, and mainly during the uh, last decade of his reign, which is the 90s, so we had two constitutional reforms, one in 1992 and the second one in 1996. And the second constitutional revision was really under the pressure of the uh, uh, coalition party, uh, uh, the opposition composed of the socialist and leftist uh, political parties. Uh, we had also the inclusion of the Islamists, that is uh, the king allowing what is called now the PGD, the Party of Justice and Development. He allowed this uh, group to integrate an existing political party, not to form a political party, but to integrate an existing political party in 1996. And then uh, they changed the name of the MPCD, Mouvement Populaire Constitutionnel et Démocratique, to the Party of Justice and Development in 1998. Perhaps it would be good for them to know that religious parties or uh, territorial parties are forbidden in Morocco. Yes. So that's why they had to look for an, another thing that existed to, to, to buy that label. Yes. Mm -hmm. And also the MPCD was led by someone who was very close to the palace. So uh, the process of inclusion of opposition forces was all the time controlled from above. So we cannot leave something uh, happen like this. So the endurance of the monarchy is very much related to its strategy of change within continuity. I think this is uh, about uh, monarchies, uh, tout changer pour ne rien changer, on le dit toujours. Uh, so it's not something really new or smart or because very often 
when I go to conferences, especially after the Arab Spring, everybody will tell me, oh, you have a, a smart king. It's very smart what you're doing. I think it just, uh, what has been done by different monarch uh, uh, throughout the history, uh, and uh, what has been done by King Hassan II before King Mohammed VI. So what happened, it's uh, under King Mohammed VI, so we have again the same tactics. We have limited reforms, and I've already mentioned what King Mohammed VI uh, uh, put forward uh, during the first years of his reign. We had some repression. In Morocco, especially during the past decade, after everything calmed down in the region, in Morocco, not in the region, because nothing is in the region, but in Morocco, 2013, more use of violence and repression in Morocco to counter mm. uh, protest actions. Uh, and even before, like Gdemizik, uh, it was violently repressed uh, by the police. There are different reports from national and international human rights organization denouncing the violence used against uh, protesters. We have the Hirak of the Reef uh, uh, recently, and just uh, last weekend, we had uh, the teachers, the march of the teachers I spoke about was again repressed by, by the police. So, to illustrate this strategy and uh, uh, of change within continuity, because I don't want to speak about all of the protest movements and actions, but if you have specific questions during the debate, I can, of course, answer them. But I would like to take only one example, the February 20th movement, and to present how the regime dealt with this movement. And I choose the February 20th movement, not the Hirak of the Reef, because uh, uh, very often there was uh, this question, how did the monarch succeed to absorb social unrest without uh, external intervention, with minimal financial resources, with minimal violence? So what was the recipe? So I think that the February 20th movement is a more interesting case because for the Hirak of the Reef, there was more violence than the other tactics. And in order to understand this change within continuity, I would like to make a main remark. Um, first, the monarchy was never challenged during the protests, the different protests. Uh, instead, it was called upon to take actions. With the February 20th movement in Tunisia, in Egypt, in Syria, people were chanting Mubarak Erhal in Egypt. They were chanting Ben Ali Degaj on Tunisia. But in Morocco, nobody was chanting Mohammed VI Erhal or Degaj. So the issue was not about overthrow of the regime. We have to start with this because when we speak, oh, how was it? But mm -hmm. the king was not challenged. The monarchy was not challenged. So this is, I think, the first point we have to emphasize. On the contrary, people, when they go to the streets in Morocco, you will find many protesters taking the photos of the king and asking the king to take actions. So people are more in a, a, a kind of relationship, the king, as the symbol as the head of the state, as uh, um, the king is perceived as the only person who can solve the problems in Morocco. So when they go to the streets, even though they are not necessarily happy with the policies, they do not relate or do not take the king accountable or responsible for the policies or for the fact that nothing is working well in Morocco. But it's rather the government, political parties, the parliament, and they ask the king to intervene. 
The second point is that the outcome of protest actions in general is the result of a dynamic interaction between the demands of the protesters and the regime's reactions to these demands. And here, let me go and uh, sh share with you what were really the main demands of the February 20th movement. So in Morocco, they were mobilized around the reform of the constitution. Uh, the February 20th movement was composed of a group of young people with different ideological backgrounds. So we had some of the young people who were members in leftist political parties, such as Anahja Demokrati, the radical left. We had some young people who were active in human rights organizations such as LAIMDH, the Moroccan Association of Human Rights. We had some activists in the Amazir movement. We had some young people who called themselves the independents. They were affiliated, they were nowhere, in, in no political party and no union. And they called themselves the independents. And when they were writing the memorandum, they couldn't agree on a single demand. There was no unifying issue what form of the regime. The leftists, they wanted a parliamentary monarchy. The Islamists of Al-Adl wal-Ihsan, because I didn't mention that, they wanted a civil state. So there was no agreement. And after negotiations and discussion and uh, arguments and counter arguments, they came to one thing, that is a democratic constitution. That was the top and the priority, the thing they could agree upon, a democratic constitution. And it was on the top of the list of their demands. So they demanded improvements in governance and transparency, social and economic demands, separation of wealth and power. But above all, the demands were articulated around huria, freedom, karama, dignity, and adala ijtima'iya, social justice. Let, let's look at the reactions of the king. It's very easy. <laughs> the people, they wanted the democratic, that was the main thing. So the movement started on February 20th. March the 9th, the king gave a speech to the nation. He didn't mention the February 20th movement. He didn't say anything about the uprisings in the region. He said, I would like to reform the constitution. I would like to establish separation of powers. I would like to give more independence to the judiciary. All what was asked for by the movement, but without mentioning the movement, without saying anything. Because the reforms, of course, will come, it's top down, never up. Uh, down, bottom, uh, up, bottom, <laughs> down up. bottom up, sorry. So it's all the time initiator of the pace of reform. So th uh, the king gave this speech, and of course, the mainstream political parties supported the constitutional reform. So most of the main political parties allied with the king, so there was no discussion. And uh, we had no... Uh, uh, <coughs> Constitutional Assembly was elected to draft the project of the Constitution. Rather, the king appointed a royal committee which was in charge of drafting the project of the 2011 Constitution. We had some kind of legislative elections, anticipated legislative elections, and uh, a, a coalition government was formed in November 2011 and it was led by the Islamist Party of Justice of Development, the PGD, who had received a plurality of votes. And of course, uh, the constitution, the 2011 constitution, was adopted by referendum in July 2011. So there was more, <laughs> there was more reform and here I can say why. You remember the dosage of reform, the repression, reform, cooptation? The regional context was not in favor of using violence. 
So I'm speaking about 2011, the beginning. Nobody knew that uh, things will develop uh, in these directions, like what were the chaos in Libya. Uh, uh, I don't know how to call Egypt uh, uh, persistent, authoritarian. I, I don't know how to call the system, but what happened uh, in Egypt or Syria. So uh, nobody knew that things will evolve not towards more democracy and human rights, but a return to authoritarianism um, in different uh, countries. So we had this uh, opening. Uh, so it was more reform because there was the regional context. Nothing was clear for, for, for the regime. The regime used also a bit of cooptation, and this time it was from the activists themselves. Uh, I can mention the case of Usama al Khalifi, who was uh, a leader, one of the leaders of the movement, and uh, who uh, joined the PAM, the Party of Authenticity and Modernity. This political cr party was created in 2008 by a close friend of the king called Fuad Ali al-Himma. And uh, uh, after uh, posting uh, photos of him, I'm speaking here about uh, Usama al-Khalifi with the flag of the February 20th movement. Afterwards, he was posting photos with the logo of the political party behind. And that was really um, uh, a sign of how the regime could co-opt some of the young activists into the establishment or into political parties very close to the system. <laughs> Repression and intimidation of the protesters and their families. I can mention here uh, activists such as uh, Kamal al-Umari from the city of Safi, who died in May 2011 as a result of injuries inflicted by the police. I can speak also about discrediting the protesters. Official media covered the activities of the M20 in a biased way, and activists were very often represented as a source of instability. And here I can mention that the same has been used for the activists of the Hirak of the Reef, the discrediting, uh, uh, discrediting the protesters and calling them as uh, uh, as uh, traitors. Mm -hmm. So to conclude, uh, what can we learn? Uh, the regime has been successful in weakening the February 20th movement, the Hirak of the Reef, and other protest actions or protest uh, movements. However, Moroccans continue to organize sit-ins, demonstrations, and to sign petitions to express their disenchantment with state policy when their political, social, and economic rights are at stake. For me, without addressing these deficits, the monarchical regime might be challenged by social groups less peaceful than the demonstrators who were calling for a real constitutional monarchy in 2011, or those calling for their right to employment and education in the Reef. The persistent social mobilization around various social, economic, and political issues shows that the expectations are high, and that in the current conjuncture, the regime cannot stay ahead of the growing curve of demands. If the regime does not deliver and here I'm speaking about policies, real reforms in the field of, in the social and economic fields. Repression might create frustration and implant the seeds of social unrest, violence, and radicalization. I thank you for, thank you, for your attention. Thank you. So now we have about good half an hour uh, for discussion uh, among us. Who